Good morning, everybody. My name is Allie Rogan. I'm a foreign affairs producer with the PBS NewsHour. I'm also the author of Beat Breast Cancer Like a Boss, 30 Powerful Stories. And I want to welcome all of you to the Concordia Live session today on the power and perceptions of preventive care in women's health. It's my honor to first introduce all of our esteemed panelists, beginning with Ambassador Nancy Brinker, who you all know is the founder of Susan G. Komen. She's also the co-founder of the Promise Fund of Florida and a member of the Concordia Leadership Council. We also have Dr. Susan Harvey, who's the Vice President of Global Medical Affairs at Hologic, Courtney Hesselbacher, the Portfolio Director for US Enterprise at Gallup Inc., and Her Excellency Toyin Siraki, the founder and president of the Wellbeing Foundation. She is also a member of the Concordia Leadership Council. Uh, and with that, I'm going to kick it over to Dr. Harvey for uh, some additional uh, introductory remarks. Just before I do, though, a, a couple housekeeping issues. Um, all of you are muted upon your entry, but we do hope that you'll take advantage of the chat feature to introduce yourself, react to comments, and engage throughout the conversation. Um, we do ask that you submit some uh, questions, um, and we encourage you to utilize the chat function at the bottom of your screen to do that. Yeah. Also, this webinar is going to be recorded and will be available on the Concordia website site and YouTube channel. The Q&A por portion is not going to be recorded, and that is going to be via special membership access only. So with that, uh, Dr. Harvey, over to you. Thank you, Allie, uh, for the warm introduction and welcome. And I am so delighted to be here with these talented women today to talk about this subject. So prior to Hologic, I spent 30 years in academic medicine providing clinical care across the continuum of breast cancer care. And about 15 years ago, uh, a new checkbox came up on my list. And that checkbox was, how do we make the world a better place? And now that I'm at Hologic, I'm so fortunate to be part of the Hologic Global Women's Health Index and the team that's working on this. About three years ago, our CEO, Steve McMillan, asked the question, what are we doing for women's healthcare globally? And as we all pondered this, what we found is there was no single expert organization or group. In fact, there wasn't a group of people tracking women's health. And we all know what we can't measure, we can't improve. So that led us to partnership <clears throat> an incredible partnership with the Gallup World Poll. And we, it, remarkably, I should say Gallup was able in 2020 during the pandemic to reach out to 116 countries in more than 140 languages, 60,000 women were interviewed. <clears throat> and we learned so much to understand the current state of women's health. We learned that every every single country has work to do. The average score out of 100 was 54, and the highest score was 69. Again, every country has work to do. We also learned that there are five dimensions of health, which explain 80% of a woman's life expectancy. Preventive care, basic needs, individual health, opinions of health and safety, <clears throat> as well as emotional health. If we change any of these five dimensions, we will improve the quality of women's lives and ultimately life expectancy. Preventive health, we identified as the most significant of these five dimensions. And we learned that over a billion women had not even spoken to a healthcare provider in the prior year 1.5 billion women had not been tested for four categories of significant and preventable diseases. Number one was only a third of women had been tested for blood pressure, despite the fact that cardiovascular and neurovascular disease is the biggest killer of women. Second biggest killer of women, cancer. 
only 12% of women around the world reported they've been tested for any cancer. Diabetes, the sixth largest killer and the fastest growing, low numbers of women were tested and also sexually transmitted diseases and, and infections. We understand that there are several significant components. Age at first pregnancy impacts every aspect of women's health. Safety and basic needs are a requirement for women to focus on their health. Our overall takeaway was we need to detect deadly diseases early. We need to keep women safe in their homes and their communities. And we need to keep women in education so that they are capable of achieving independence. So what are we going to do about this? We're going to continue to listen. We've committed to the Gallup World Poll for, for the next upcoming years. We will convene, we will work to convene the right partners so that these observations and this data is used for action to impact policy and to impact the goals where we're headed with women's health and bring it up as a priority. We will champion the actions that come out of convening these partners and we will continue to track in the years to come so that we can see how the impacts of actions are taking place and, and helping women. There are 3.9 billion women in the world and they all need us. So together, we're going to work to improve the quality and longevity for women. Thank you very much for allowing me this time. All right, it's my pleasure to kick off uh, a discussion. We will um, chat for uh, a portion of this segment and then we're gonna leave some time for Q&A. So please, we encourage you to uh, submit any questions that you in the audience have. My first question is going to be to Nancy. Um, how can governments and public leaders better prioritize women's health care? What actions do you want to see? How can partnerships within the private sector uh, help governments achieve those goals? Let's start with you. Well, the key to ensuring that governments and uh, public leaders only prioritize key, prioritize key issues and subjects regarding women, uh, as Dr. Harvey said, we have to make meaningful change with data, benchmarking it, data sets, data points. We cannot fix what we don't measure properly. The next thing I want to mention to you, which was very interesting, at the World Economic or the World Health Forum this past few months or past fall that we had in, in Berlin, one of the top public health care scientists in the world stood up after listening to a lot of our data and discussion of women's health and said, you know, women's health is as important as climate change. It affects that many lives. Women are the backbone of their families, and we know all the reasons why that is so, and that all of us should focus on making this a higher priority. That was music to my ears. Um, I've been doing this for almost 50 years. That is present at the um, announcement of the war on cancer, which is the second leading killer of women. And... Um, by, by President Richard Nixon and adopted by all the subsequent presidents. And yet we haven't made the um, progress we should be making. Uh, the first and then the second thing, of course, is this wonderful global health survey because we can pull from it so many supporting statements for the facts that we need and the, and the positions we want to take. But I don't honestly don't see how we go forward, particularly with cancer and other diseases, by not applying what we know. And that is removing the barriers in government, barriers that we have created. Uh, one that is particularly interesting to me is the United States Preventive Task Force, who every few years assesses the value of screening when we know that screening detects, can detect very early disease and hence while well, we're careful to say screening will save your life, screening will make sure that if you have a disease, it's found earlier. And the earlier you find breast and cervical cancers, which are the two leading cancer killers of women, you're going to save more lives. This shouldn't even be discussed anymore. It's just a firm principle. So I get a little worked up over it because 
We have to partner with world leaders, organizations, private companies, and we have to do it often. We can't just do it once and forget it. We have to constantly uh, uh, set, we have to visit with our friends. Troyan, we need to visit with you every three or four months to see how things are going in Africa. We need to know how things are going in every continent of the world and address them then. What important meetings are happening? What important not-for-profits are going and what are they doing? And when we look to some of the barriers in healthcare, uh, it's because we haven't uh, explored making them bigger, making them more understandable and immediate to what we're doing. Um, we have so many barriers that women suffer and we call them social determinants of care. So we have our biggest um, barrier with the Promise Fund, the new organization that I've started where we've made our goal to, go to navigate screen, treat over 80,000 women with no health care in the world's wealthiest county, Palm Beach County, and also the poorest county, living just right together. How do we ameliorate this number? How do we fix this? So uh, we're tackling these things by um, increasing detection. Women are running to our subsidized screening centers where they never had a chance to get it and fixing the, socially deter the social determinants to care. They didn't have transportation, we engaged a transportation company to get there. Uh, things at home aren't quite right, they don't have enough food. We have lots of ways to provide these things, especially in the United States. So that's how I think we begin to elevate this subject to a very high level, but we have to do it almost every day. We have to talk to an influence, an influential person, organization, or maybe even a, just a patient who's suffering some of the side effects and make it verbal, make it known. And Nancy, to your point, um, when we talk about women's health, um, we absolutely always have to be talking about maternal health. And so for that, I want to turn to Toyin to ask, um, why is, um, what role does maternal health play in, in society? Um, it's just such a fundamentally um, critical part of just how every society works. So I wanna mine into that a little bit. And also about what are some of the broader implications when um, maternal health is improved? What steps should leaders take to prioritize improvements in maternal health? Thank you so much, Ali, and thank you to everybody who's on this very important conversation. I'm particularly happy to be here because I work in a sphere where data has not been universally accessible enough to be able to really guide the actions that we need to take at the front line and we also need to take at the center. To us, maternal health is the first and most vital component of building healthy societies, economies, and our nation across the region of Africa. Healthy mothers lead to healthy families and strong health systems. It's also important to note that even though gender bias really does affect us as African women, the one place where an African woman is valued is as a mother. And so for a lot of our women who do not normally access health, their first point of contact with proper health care in a health facility is usually because they are pregnant. So even if they don't access health at any other point, they will access health when they are pregnant. Maternal health then has a direct impact on the welfare of our societies, especially in many of the developing countries, because a mother's death is much more than an emotional crisis for us. It often leads to long-term social and economic breakdown, both for her immediate family and the wider community. And we have to keep in mind that it is already the most vulnerable, minoritized and marginalized and disadvantaged women in our societies that have this increased risk of maternal death and need proper maternal health care. These women and even ourselves are caregivers, homemakers, breadwinners and the silent heroes of the marginalized societies. We live in an entangled web of complex inequalities that are beyond our control, which impacts on the care that we receive and the outcomes of that care and affect our entire community. We are often the sole income earners in nearly one third of all our households globally. And in addition, 
we contribute the most to the unpaid work, such as water collection, caring for children, caring for the sick and caring for the elderly. Our unpaid work equals one third of the world's gross national product. All the studies we've seen on household expenditure show that we spend more than men do on welfare, improving goods and services for our families, such as food, education, and medicine. So we further the health and well-being of our communities, but not of ourselves, and certainly not where it comes to preventive maternal health. The children whose mothers die are at an increased risk of dying themselves within the first year, and older surviving children are more likely to leave school to support the family. For many girls who have lost their mothers, the only viable option that remains towards prospects for the future is early marriage and then early motherhood themselves, which then puts them at risk. So both the school dropouts and early marriages are renewing the cycle of poverty for the next generation. We know that the future of our societies depends upon healthy women and mothers. So we must make maternal health a positive and predictive experience to ensure that our women and their babies can actually reach their full potential for health and well being, not just lurching from one emergency to another. We know that maternal deaths are preventable with timely management by a skilled health professional who is working in a supportive environment and it actually gets better when that skilled health professional is a woman themselves. So we must keep maternal health at the top of the global agenda and go beyond just looking for the safer births and safer childbirth to actually ensure that this investment is investing in maternal health from birth to age. So simply surviving pregnancy and childbirth must not be our marker of successful maternal health care. It's critical that we expand the efforts to reduce maternal injury and disability, to promote health and well-being for our society as a whole. If we can address the inequalities that are affecting our health outcomes, especially sexual and reproductive health, rights and gender, we can actually ensure that all women and girls in our societies have access to respectful and high quality family health care. At the end of the day, our strategies and pathways need to be identified, which this poll has actually identified for the first time so excitingly, and then put in the right places to improve the maternal health situation. We have been let down as women in the way that our maternity and reproductive health services are currently delivered. But this shows us that we can find a better way to record the social determinant data as well, to plan and program around this so that we can actually build programming that is fit for purpose and doesn't just provide us with just enough information to intervene in an emergency, but moves towards the information that we need to understand the complex circumstances circumstances of women, maternal health, and society at large. Toyin, can I ask you a question that was really inspirational to hear and accurate? I think we all feel that way. What about the, the continuing issues of healthcare beyond the maternal? In your society and in others you observe, do you find that uh, there is just as much respect for the woman at in her maternal role as in her productive role later on? So that is the healthcare are the healthcare needs being addressed in older women the way they should be? The healthcare needs of older women are not even addressed at all. I can even speak to you from personal experience that when I entered the menopause, nobody had told me. It's, it's just not put into our health system that the needs of the female gender actually change according to age. And we need to actually actualize this. And then we need to plan economically for this to ensure that we are being productive at every step of our lives. But I really wouldn't want the investment to be tied to the productivity, so much of investments around women are only tied to what a woman can give back to her country. This is not the same sort of investment that is put around male children or the male themselves. We need to actually move to 
equity and equality, not just from the health perspective, but from what you will call the value of a statistical life. So we need to be able to treat the specific needs of the female gender with regard to health, not just from our childbearing capacity or what we can do for the family, but what value are we to our country, ourselves, and what do the public systems need to do to put these implications into place and make them real. You spoke about cancer earlier. Every single screening program that I have ever done has been a charitable program where I am donating screening to people. Yet this screening is taking place in laboratories, diagnostic centers, and the hospitals that are supposed to be delivering health. So why is screening not calculated as a cost in our public health system? Why does this preventive screening or for tracking and detecting diseases early, why does it have to be a charitable program? Why isn't it part of a woman's right to health or a woman and a girl's right to health? Now this poll that has just come out from Hologic and from Gallup then provides our leaders with the evidence that they need easily accessible in every country that has work to do to say, look, put this into your public system, calculate for this, account for this, plan for this, and be able to deliver this accountably. We have to move beyond a woman finding her cancer when it becomes an open wound to a woman having that right to be screened and having that right to be referred. And if a woman has that right, you can guarantee that whatever a woman has, just because of our nurturing capacity, will spread to her family. If a woman has the right to be screened and be treated, her entire family will be able to access that right to be screened and be treated. So we must look at the broader implications and make sure that the maternal health care is as comprehensive as it needs to be to include the educational, social, nutritional services, as well as the medical care and cost post and during pregnancy. Mm -hmm. So in the, a phrase you used a minute ago, the value of a statistical life, I think that just really sums up the essence of what we're talking about today and why it's so important to have these metrics and be able to flush them out into policies. And uh, I think that's something I want to follow up with Dr. Harvey and asking about what is the value of some of these non-traditional health indicators like as this survey um, went into basic needs and safety. How does that improve women's health around the world? Um, and why is why are those things so important to consider when viewing women's health as a global issue? That's a fabulous question. Thank you, Ali. Um, so it's impossible to separate women's health from the circumstances in which a woman finds herself. And I have sort of one very broad example and one very specific personal example. The first broad example is, and while this may seem um, dramatic, what are the women of Ukraine thinking about right now? They are not thinking about wellness. And we could substitute climate change for yeah. Ukraine, right? The, the circumstances that women find themselves in, a lack of food, a lack of shelter, all has an impact and is inseparable from healthcare. My personal story is I grew up in a very rural part of Vermont with a, a mom who was working hard and we had very few resources. And I remember watching her decide, was the electricity bill going to be paid that month or was she going to the doctor? Right? Those decisions are made and they have an impact. We cannot ignore them. And we have 90 million women telling us that they are food insecure and 700 million women telling us they have insecurity on shelter. And so their focus cannot be on preventive care and getting to the doctor and taking care of themselves and their families. Their risk factors for basic needs um, tends to be that younger women are at higher risk. Women who've had a teenage pregnancy 
again, which impacts every aspect of their health, and also women who have lower education levels, high school or less, are at risk. We also need to consider, are these women safe? If you're not safe in your home and you're not safe walking in your community, the ability to engage in health care is limited. And we've spoken about education already. It is critical for empowerment of women and for them to become independent. So again, the circumstances are absolutely critical to health. And we need to look at these as we move forward in our opportunities to impact and improve women's health globally. Um, I, I, Allie, I'd like to add to that. You did such a great job, Susan, describing this. I think there also, we need to help women in countries where there may not be a democratic governments available. It's it's hard enough in our own country in the U.S. To, to push these kinds, but we need to have women stop apologizing for wanting these things for ourselves and our families. We need to stop it and, and not say, oh, it's okay. Put it on the end of the agenda. No, no. Put it right at the top of the agenda. Here are the facts. And uh, until we do that, we won't make, you know, the lion has to roar somewhere. And I don't see it coming. I often see in our own country, in my own town, in my own organization, I see this, it's okay if they put us at the end of the agenda. No, it's not anymore. All of our news reporters should be putting it at the top because the consequences are so great. You know, in every area, not just the economy, but the social fabric of our universe is based on, let's face it, on what women can do and particularly producing the next generation. Um, that is important, but we somehow have to gain the courage and, in, 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 encourage other women to be okay with feeling very bold once in a while. Amen to that. Uh, I think in, in matters of uh, women's health and all other areas of life. And um, to digress to what Dr. Harvey was saying a minute ago about you know, what are the women of Ukraine thinking? I, I had to think about uh, in the first days of the strikes, how there was a baby born in an underground subway wow. that has been transformed into a shelter and how that really signifies that women's care, maternal health, it never stops. Right. It's a constant factor in every uh, f part of life, in every major news event that we're seeing in the world. And so it's so important that we keep a spotlight on it. And turning back to the survey, Courtney, I want to ask you, what are some of the key findings and implications of this global women's health survey? And also, what were some of the biggest surprises that you found? Yeah, thanks so much for that, Ali. <clears throat> you know, I think when, when we think about what was most startling from these findings, certainly some of the uh, statistics um, this wonderful panel has cited around basic needs, food and shelter are uh, shocking. But I think one of the newest sets of findings and, and really startling for Gallup um, were the findings around preventative care. Um, seeing that only about one in three women globally were tested for any of the four diseases that have the most adverse effect on their lives. And some of these screenings are very low cost. You think about something like taking a blood pressure reading, mm -hmm. doing a glucose test to get early detection of diabetes. Um, and cancer, only 12% uh, of women globally were tested for any kind of cancer last year. Right. And I think what was particularly fascinating was when we layered in um, healthcare expenditures by country with this data. Um, certainly there's an influence there, but it's, it's not the whole story. You know, in the US, we spend more on healthcare uh, per capita than anywhere in the world, but only 25% of women, uh, 40 to 74, were tested for any kind of cancer in the past year. Um, if you consider the breast cancer screening guidelines of a screening every one to two years, we're already well below the minimum of at least 50% of women having that screening with that 25% number. And I think certainly the COVID pandemic exacerbated this and we're starting to see the outcomes of that. A recent study was just released um, specifically for breast cancer citing that the rate of uh, breast cancers being detected at stage one has decreased by half um, in comparing 2019 data to 2020 data. 
Um, we have to see these numbers rebound. We have to see that bounce back. Um, you know, as we emerge from the pandemic, as our focus shifts, um, that is just going to be, be critical for women in the US and globally. Um, I think the other set of findings that were really shocking were just around women's emotional health. Uh, when we think of women as the cornerstones of healthy societies and communities and families, that emotional health is such an important foundation for everything that goes on in that day to day. And we saw nearly two in five women reporting worry and stress in their previous day, nearly one in four experiencing sadness and anger just in the previous day. Um, when you think about those numbers, uh, we really have to put that focus back on not just women getting us through this difficult period and being champions for their families, but really what are their needs as individuals as well. And, and oftentimes, just to add to your narrative, which was really, really good, Courtney, is the, is the idea that we as women don't often get the same training men do. Fewer, so many fewer men are in the armed services, for example, where most of the budget of our country <laughs> goes in a way. And shouldn't we be thinking about, besides just women's organizations, civil training for women about education, about all the other areas in our countries and in our lives that matter, that make us productive, that will help us lead, that will take away this sense that our issues aren't as important. And I wish I knew what agency that was. I'm not sure whether it should be a government agency or should it be the Red Cross or the large charities who should be doing this, offering two years of say an education program after university or concurrent with university, preparing women to be leaders that's what men get to do. I'm not saying that it's bad what we do for men. I'm saying, why don't we have the same equivalent for women? <laughs> Very well said. Agreed. <laughs> well, some won't think you know, so, but that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> I, think, I think we can all agree that if you're tuning into this panel or on it, <laughs> you agree. Um, so with that, we have uh, just under 15 minutes left, and we've gotten some really wonderful uh, questions from the audience. So I want to turn to them. And actually, I think this is a really great segue, given the points that Nancy, you just brought up. And that is from um, Madeline uh, Garnett, who says, Hologic has led the charge for the private sector to address women's health. But what can other corporate entities, in particular financial institutions with huge amounts of capital, do to support smaller ventures who are attempting to provide basic health services to women. Right, and, um, it's, uh, it's really important that on every uh, tablet, whether it's electronic or not, that a corporation has a listing, the critical uh, points at which they should be giving back. Um, I mean, I'm always interested to watch what companies give back to. Some of them are, are influenced by their board of directors or by you know, it's okay, that's their right to do that, of course. But I think the, in the strategic plan of the company has to be to develop the strength of women in whatever way they can. And they can start in their own community because I found it interesting that a lot of companies are centered in towns and cities where there are actually huge disparities for women in healthcare, education, and can start right where they are. It doesn't have to be a billion dollar program. It has to be a billion dollars of emotional response, of EQ. And, and I would just like to see it so much. People start where they live. That is how the best things grow. People like to own it. They like to build it, develop it, and then share it and replicate it. And I just think your question brought up a lot of things, should be bringing up a lot of thinking about where do we begin and keep the end in mind. Where do we want to be in the end? I, I would just add to that a fantastic response, Nancy. I think the other recommendation we would give is really look at investing in those organizations that have data-backed approaches right. and are focused on outcomes, right? I think there can be some focus on what can we do to grab a headline or get in the news? And there are so many fantastic ways to evaluate the real impact that organizations right. are having on women's lives. I think that's an incredibly important factor for these large organizations to consider in making their commitments. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the every mission of every private or, or even public not-for-profit, at least in America, and I don't, it, I know how it works in other countries, but not always 
the same thing. NGOs are not valued the same way. I mean, everybody has a different path to follow, but you're absolutely right. What are the outcomes of the program you've taken on and how is it benefiting everybody? And in this case, the strength of women. Um, and, and there just shouldn't be any decision. Well, we need a couple of women on the board. I've heard that more than twice over my career. Uh, oh, we need a few women. Who, who can we get here? Who knows a woman? I mean, that's ridiculous. It should be here are 15 qualified people. <laughs> and if I could jump in, I don't know if I can jump in here. You know, I get that question a lot from private sector um, players. And I've also seen how engaging in outreaches with the private sector can actually move global development. We've seen it the first time with the Every Woman, Every Child effort. We're beginning to look at it now with the World Bank's GFF. But I would like to ask the private sector to really look at the communities around them and look at at the organizations and actors that are already reaching right. the women in those communities. I will always, always say it, that we need to really support the midwifery and nursing workforces because you know childbirth starts with midwifery and then it moves on to nursing and really the nursing and midwifery workforces they're almost like the invisible war horses in the room everybody wants to be looking at the doctors but you know the doctor pops in if you're very lucky twice a day and the rest of the 24 hours where you're really if you are fortunate to be in the right place it's the midwife or the nurse that is actually going to be looking after you. At the Wellbeing Foundation, we placed midwives at the center of all our programming in 2014. And we went from reaching two or 300 women a month to reaching 8,000 women a month. And even now we're using digital technologies to stay in touch with them. So when women are the health worker, that is the interlocutor that is reaching the woman, she already understands their needs and she can be that bridge to connect them to the formalized sort of help that they need, whether it's a referral in case of gender violence or teaching her how to check herself for a breast lump. So it keeps the continuum of contact yes. and conversation going that links you to what is available out there that you might not even have known was available. And we have run very many programs to actually upskill the frontline health workforce. And that is definitely a component. It doesn't matter how much I try and persuade a woman to go into the hospital. If the workforce in that hospital is not properly trained, skilled, and remunerated, even when she gets there, she's not going to get the sort of care she wants, and she's not going to want to go back there again. And I think this building of trust of quality services is going to be the real game changer. So I would ask all the sectors, actually, not just the private sector, to really look at health system strengthening through health workforce strengthening and through, you know, widening those skills to be able to get specialist skills. For instance, in Nigeria, we don't even have up to 10% of our nursing workforce being actually skilled as qualified oncology nurses. Right. So even dealing with a family, I, I've dealt with a case, for instance, where it was clear to me from the records that were in front of me that the patient was not going to live more than two more days. And um, the people around couldn't understand why I was initiating a transfer of that patient. Now I was initiating a transfer of that patient because of a single parent family. And so I knew that I had to move the mom who was not going to make it to a center where it just so happened to be owned by somebody I knew, but I knew they'd be able to provide the holistic support for the daughter when the mom would inevitably pass. I initiated the transfer thinking we had two days. In fact, we had six hours. And the last thing she said was, I'm serene now. I feel I can go now. Please look after my daughter. But that sort of holistic care should be available for everyone. It shouldn't have been, you know, my son calling me that a friend of his, the mom might not make it. And, you know, literally it was a mummy. What can you do? But I literally brought out the procedure book and I had to initiate all those procedures very quickly. But 
What if I wasn't there? What if I didn't have the Wellbeing Foundation? What would have happened to that family? And how many other families are in that situation? We have a 22% um, cancer detection prevalence. And that was just one case. But then I've seen another case recently, this week actually, where um, 12 days ago, a lady called and she was uh, wealthy enough to have had a prevent you know, preventative screening. So kidney cancer was detected. And as per usual, the call came to me because people trust me. And I said, no, we can treat this in Nigeria. You don't need to become a health tourist. And I'm, I'm confident, I give you my guarantee. Trust me, we can treat this. And yesterday I went to the hospital to wish her goodbye because she was leaving the hospital to go home. So if all the right um, steps are in place, we can actually, even in Nigeria, we can actually achieve the right sort of quality prompt treatment, but it takes an intentionality. It's not random. You know, I, I, I didn't jump over or shortcut anything. I just did everything that should have been done, but I did it in four days. And then she was able to get the surgery as opposed to being referred here and there and not knowing who's good. And, and, you know, this is a standard that should be available to everybody and even communicating what is Brian, available is part of this. I'm sorry, I don't mean to, I just want sorry, to ask yeah. an important question. Do you know that in, and, and you do know the, what we would call, what you're calling midwives, we would call navigators in the United States. Yes. And we do the same thing in the promised one. We assign the patient you're describing, because this patient is all over the world, um, and to a navigator, and and it's their first relationship into a medical a medical home. They don't even have; they never been to a doctor. They haven't had. And I, what you're expressing is exactly what we're experiencing. If you provide the navigator with the patient, and this relationship continues. You will not have a woman with the problems that they're having today because they have a way to attach, to connect. And, and the navigator is exactly doing the things you're talking about. And we hope in the United States, this continues to grow. It is somewhere between a social worker and a nurse. And it's critical at a much lower cost than we're spending now in our healthcare system. Absolutely. Uh, and it also seems like it's, it's so important, as Toyin was saying, to focus on the whole patient, not just... Right the part right. of the body that is ailing them at that right. moment. We just have a few minutes left, but I wanna end with a question that somebody um, uh, asked about mental health. This was Charlotte Brandon, who runs Global Health Promise, which focuses on women who are in sex work and their children. She asks, um, to what extent um, was mental health part of the study? So I'll pose that to Dr. Harvey, but perhaps we could also you know, talk generally for just a couple minutes about why mental health is such an important factor here. Um, thank you for this question. It's, it's absolutely fabulous. And we did not explore mental health because we were surveying women and we were getting information, listening to information about their experiences of health and safety. Um, it's impossible, therefore, to ask a question about mental health. So what we did ask about was emotional health. And they are obviously directly linked. And as Courtney has pointed out, the Gallup World Poll has tracked emotional health since 2005. And in this time frame, it is the most negative emotional health that's been recorded by the World Poll. And the impact of this is tremendous. The impact is both a mind and body health connection, which has been proven, um, extensively proven with cardiovascular disease. It is, it is hypothesized with cancer diagnoses as well. And again, impacting women's capacity and empowerment for families, communities, and economies. So it is a critical component. So it is something we must focus on and it reflects how society is impacting women as well. Whether that is related to conflict, whether it's related to rich religious beliefs and structures and culture, uh, we understand 
that these things impact women's emotional health. And we are aware how critical it is. And please, uh, others um, add in. Well, I before anybody does, and thank you so much. Uh, I think we are officially at time. Um, so uh, perhaps if the Concordia folks can weigh in here if we have a few minutes, but otherwise, I do think, unfortunately, we have to wrap it up. Although I think everybody here would agree that we could all talk about this for another few hours. Um, but I know I'm gonna leave this so inspired by everything we've talked about today and motivated to um, bring some of these values that we discussed into my work. And I'm sure everybody here feels the same way. So thank you all so much. Have a wonderful rest of your day. And uh, we really appreciate everybody being a part of this conversation. Thank you, Ali. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.